the empire had now been truly steeped in terror of the apocalypse. Their cities burned and rotted, their populace weakened from the fallout of Glotkin plagues. However, something was amiss. Sigmar's sons seemed to be, without the aid of their allies, the horse lords of Britonia, the merchant giants Talea, Astalia, and the border princes, and the mountain dwarfs encompassing the empire's southwestern and far east flanks, all of whom seemed to be plagued by their own hellscapes, not yet revealed to the Empire of Man. Was this another trick by the Chaos God Sinch? Or was there yet another harrowing threat that also sought to overrun the world? The Empire will deny the existence of these creatures, but in the end, the truth that they so desperately try to deny is much, much worse. Welcome to our latest episode on the end times of Warhammer Fantasy, where we will cover the first Skaven invasion. Let's say you live in the Empire and you want to make a YouTube video exposing the existence of an undercity of evil rats. Where do you even start with that? Well, since the average Empire citizen has no video making experience, they should use the sponsor of this video, Wondershare Filmora 11. It's video editing software that needs no experience to get high quality results, thanks to its suites of extremely helpful features. For example, take Instant Mode, a feature where you pick a template for what the video is going to be, feed in your raw footage, and it basically makes the video for you by detecting good moments and arranging things according to the template. Want to get your rat ranting in text? Filmora 11 includes automatic speech-to-text generation, so a transcript will be created automatically. Couldn't be easier. And if you want to jazz the frames up with some animations, you can use their intelligent keyframe system to pick the beginning and end of your animation, and it will automatically fill in the rest for you and make it work. Nice and easy. There are loads more features too, and the best thing is probably to just try them for yourself. You can use Filmora 11 for free with a watermark, you can get a yearly subscription to always have the newest version, or buy only Filmora 11 for a set price. Right now, they've got a Black Friday sale with a load of discounts too. Check it all out and find the downloads at our link in the description. The old world was no stranger to monsters in the night. To their southeast, their own tainted county of Sylvania crawls with vampires and their dead servants. Herds of beastmen carve a warpath from deep within the forests, emerging to raid and pillage the underbelly of the empire. The Glotkin have firmly proven their might at the port of Marienburg, and yet there seems to be no end in sight to the atrocities that will take place before the final curtain of war. Where were the allies of the Sons of Sigmar? Where were the unmatched cavaliers of Fair Britonia to the west? To the south, while the events of the northern wars were unfolding, the Empire's conspiracy of silence would be exposed, one tunnel at a time. The knowledge that the entire land from the wilds of Kislev in the north to the border princes in the south, is riddled and undermined by the burrows of an innumerable foe bent on our utter destruction would cause widespread despair. So, though we know of their existence, for the good of the people, those of us in possession of this dangerous knowledge must remain silent and fight them in secret. Hieronymus Ostwald, personal secretary of the Countess Emanuel von Liebwitz that innumerable, nameless foe was known as Skaven, massive, chittering rat men consumed with verminous hunger. In the end times, these scheming and ruthless creatures wrought international instability through carefully planned assassinations and devastating ambushes. For the Empire, however, there were no Skaven. At least, that's what the politicians said. For the rest of the world, they knew that all tunnels led to Skaven Blight. Below the Arana Mountains, where the highland streams pour into a river delta, a forgotten sunken city housed the sprawling subterranean city of Skaven Blight. Despite the city being the best kept secret in the world, it was also the largest and most densely packed, even among other Skaven holds. The city's exterior, that had managed to resist sinking into the dense marshes and bogs of the delta, became a well-hidden behemoth of defensive authority. Dense, poisonous smog from the swamp blotted out the light of the sun and made travel near impossible. Starvation and drowning were common fates among those brave enough to adventure too far into the natural defense. 
For the few with the misfortune to live long enough and encounter a flotilla of Skaven slaves, they made for easy food for the hordes below. The Lord Sigmar sends me visions of hell. I see gigantic treadmills eternally turning in the dark. I see uncountable masses of swarming vermin standing on their hind legs in a foul parody of man. I see diabolic machines made by deranged mutants. I see bloated queens with atrophied limbs breeding their rotten offspring. All this I see, and in my head the dreadful tolling of the cursed bell still screams. It won't stop. The multitude of red eyes stare at us from the darkness of sewers and graves. They loathe us, and they will rise to devour us for all our sins. Make it stop. Please make it stop. Hieronymus Buscus. Skavenblight proper, deep within the bowels of the earth, was a city booming with technological horrors and hordes of ratmen. The underground metropolis is a stinking, perplexing maze of crude architecture framing horrid pits and laboratories. While the slaves from each clan toil away in mines or submit themselves to torture and experimentation, stronger rats that are fit or high enough in status compete in deadly arena games. Even still, the labyrinth of Skavenblight hides nightmarish secrets, twisting dark corridors where Skaven scheme for supremacy among their own race, but more importantly, plan for the final apocalypse of the empires of men. During the end times, the most notable ruling clans were Clan Skyr, masters of techno-sorcery, Clan Mulder, genius mutation scientists, Clan Eshin, chiefest of the Skaven's deadliest assassins, Clan Pestilens, devotees of plague and pestilence, Clan Moors, the mightiest of warlords and vermin warriors, Clan Richters, breeders of strong black-furred warriors, and the Order of the Grey Seers. From each, they provided the Skaven military bodies, magics and machines to ensure their place among the Lords of Decay, the Council of Twelve Rulers of the Under Empire, and interpreters of their god's will, who symbolically claimed the thirteenth seat. While not exalted among the four chaos gods, the great horned rat is a similar deity of devastation, given power through the fearful devotion of his skaven children. He gnaws upon reality with a patient, endless hunger and awaits the day of the great ascendancy when his skaven children will overrun the world. With each year that passes during the end times, the time seems to creep ever closer. By the time the Skaven executed their first great scheme during the end times, the military of Skavenblight boasted the most horribly advanced machinations in the world. Fueled by the most coveted resource of the Skaven, Warpstone, their weapons of war harnessed the deadly and highly corruptive magic not banished by the vortex the High Elves in Uthwan created so long ago. For the Skaven, Warpstone is even more precious than gold and jewels, for within the queasy green glow of the crystalline substance is the power to mutate, corrupt, and poison anything that comes too close to the material. Of course, that means the refinement of such a resource proved incredibly dangerous, but for Skaven, their numbers are beyond counting, with legions of Skaven slaves breaking their bodies for the purpose of mining this material for their ruthless rulers to meet impossible quotas. With such a powerful resource mined at nightmarish efficiency, their arsenal of artillery and missile infantry were unmatched even by the dwarfs. When the Skaven come out to play, they bring their terrifying machines with them. Rolling into armies of footmen with infernal crushing power is the Doom Wheel, magnum opus of Clan Scryer. Powered by the turning wheel under mutated rats and infused with warpstone, the machine sports automatic warp cannons to the front and side. Designed to incinerate any defense and crush warriors beneath the spiked turning wheel, the Doom Wheel is rightfully storied among the dwarfs as the most terrible chariot to ever grace the battlefield. A smaller sister creation of the Skaven is the Doom Flayer, a motorized metal sphere that deploys massive blades at the front of the wheel to slice through foes like a knife through butter. Fast and armored, the iron ball will pierce through enemy lines and avoid most missile fire with ease. For talented rats that had earned the favor of the warlock engineers, 
they could be assigned to maintain and operate the Under Empire's artillery. The Plague Claw catapults, pestilent contagion, and the intensely unstable but fiendishly effective Warp Lightning cannons were the two favoured artillery to bring into siege and field battles alike. Protected by thousands of clan rats and storm vermin infantry, the artillery would tear through defences and monsters alike to carve a noxious path to victory for the Skaven. For an army facing the Skaven during the end times, there were yet more horrors to face. Crafted into bullets and warp fuel, the Ratmen brought death-dealing rattling guns, warp fire throwers, sniping warp lock gisales, and poisoned wind globadiers. If the mass of starving, red-eyed, frenzy of Skaven slaves and clan rats did not overrun the enemy lines, they would be torn and burnt asunder with the weapons operated by the crazed, suicidal Ratmen. Scurrying around them were hellish abominations created in torture labs, assassins, and plague priests, ripping apart any challenge that might threaten to shut down the lines of weapon teams. While the Empire was distracted with the multi-sided assault upon their nation, the creatures they insisted did not exist began to execute their first of many carefully planned schemes. The Council of Thirteen, after witnessing the failure of the Auric Bastion, launched a precise strike against the southern allies of the Empire, Talea and Estalia. The regions bordering the Talean and Southern Sea were famous for their trading empire and routes to the far regions of Lustria, Nehekara, and Ulthuan. To destroy these cities would mean the Empire and their allies in Britonia would be boxed in, forced to face the tide of Archon's vanguard and the Skaven invasion at the same time. Thus began the operation known as the Night of 1000 Terrors. From Skavenblight, Clan Eshin assassins burrowed deep under the earth and lied in wait beneath the nearby cities. Hundreds of Skaven arrived in secret through sewers and tunnels, their beady red eyes watching as the sun set on the eve of their ascension to the overworld. With the curtain of night falling, the cloaked assassins emerged simultaneously and assassinated the politicians of Talea and Astalia. In a single night, under the concealment of shadows, the Skaven rogues decimated the ruling class and retreated back to the sewers without a trace. As the sun rose the next morning, both nations were horrified to find their leaders lying in their bloodied beds, throats cut without a struggle. In a panic, the nations scrambled to reassemble themselves, pointing fingers at each other, oblivious to the assassins within their sewers. Then the sun set for another night of horrors, starting with Mireliano. With their city's social and governmental stability shaken, the military was on high alert that evening. A massive force of merchant militia stalked the streets of the outer districts of the capital, joined by traders of all nations vested in the success of the city's enormous trading hub. With three companies to the south of the Crab Gate, and two more between them and the Pearl Gate, the city was not truly sleeping. Over the deep canal and the Beggar's Channel, crossbowmen guarded the inner and outer seawalls of Moreliano's two entrances. Over the inner city's bridge, the nobles of men prepared three regiments of mounted pistoliers. Tomorrow, they would ride out to send word to Emperor Karl Franz, and to the southern reaches of Britonia with information of the mass assassinations. To guard the politically devastated capital, the wayward halberdiers of the now leaderless military encircled the most important buildings of the trade hub, whilst Prince Giuliano, a rare survivor of the assassinations, and his remaining servants scrambled to establish control over the city again. The crossbowmen closest to the Crab Gate soon received intel of more Skaven night raids to the nearby villages to the west, near the marshes of the River Delta. Relaying the information to the heart of the capital, the three companies of mounted pistoliers rode northwest, over the two bridges and into the night to investigate the rumour. By soft light of their torches, they revealed an army with 500 red-eyed Skaven pillaging and destroying the surroundings of Northwest Miraliano. From that night and for the next six days, the Skaven night runners played cat and mouse with the mounted pistoliers. Their band of raiding assassins whittled down the men one by one, cleverly separating their cavaliers one horse at a time into lethally timed snare net slings into the horse's legs. They seemed to dance around the bullets fired at them with demonic speed, 
taunting and stabbing at their prey as the night runners intentionally ran out the men's spirit and their mount's strength until the entire army had been gutted and feasted upon. Meanwhile, the outer districts of the inner city saw the rise of a deadly infection. The refugees streaming through the crab gate brought with them fevers and poxes. Sightings of giant rats seemed to increase each night after their pistoliers left. The militias patrolling the streets of the outer district soon received an order from Prince Giuliano to coordinate an effort of the extermination of any and all vermin in the city. Four days after the rush of refugees, and ten days after the doomed cavaliers made their journey west, the militia dove underground into sewers and tunnels beneath the city. In the foul maze of filth and water, Skaven gutter runner assassins weaseled around their natural playground and ambushed the militia. Each day, men from the militias would go missing. Straying too far from support or taking a wrong turn, they would fall into a trap of poisoned knives and chittering teeth. The vermin tide, a massive wave of tunnel suffocating rats, would chase away reinforcements just as the gutter runners sprung their trap. For every night the militia hacked through the vermin tide, their numbers thinned. By then, the outer village of Tremaliano had finally fallen to the Skaven. A few survivors managed to flee to the Crab Gate, and all confirmed the stories of giant rat men. For the next week, the outer district sickened with fever. Most of the remaining militia and crossbowmen on the walls had become ill and showed little signs of improvement. Marching rattled the towers of Moraliano. In the west, the night runners folded back into the lines of slaves. Thousands of Skaven slaves rushed at the western canal as a rain of arrows fired upon their hairy backs. From the wall, the crossbowmen struggled through sickness to thin out the horde with volley after volley of arrows. For one night, they managed to protect the outer wall. The next night, hundreds more Skaven slaves assaulted the crab gate piling dirt, trees and debris into the canal. When one Skaven slave would fall to the arrows of the garrison in the gate tower, they would pile their dead into the canal for more filler. Soon, a bridge of death and destruction made way for the hordes to reach the wall. Then the sun set yet again. The toll of a distant bell nears, always ringing out exactly thirteen tones. The prince himself rode from the center district towards the Crab Gate, bringing 100 men to man Hellstorm rocket artillery to lessen the burden on the crossbowmen. The Skaven slaves reached the gate and climbed over themselves like vicious animals to ascend the wall, slowed by the defenses. Crossbowmen fired down upon the rat men while the rockets from the artillery at their rear screamed over the battlements and bombarded the advancing army with explosive rounds. Boiling oil and tar were poured onto the Skaven, burning the unarmored slaves alive. When dawn came, the army retreated from the victorious shouts of men. Their casualties were thankfully low, but the most worrisome part was that their foe's army did not seem to decrease in number. The Skaven army encircled the outer city's walls by the next evening. The tolling of the bell never ceased, and the forests glowed with an eerie green bloom. There was no assault upon the walls, but the bell tolled and tolled. Under the city, however, an elite regiment of warp fire throwers and poison wind globideers advanced from the undercity and into the sewers. The time bought by the slaves above the surface enabled the gutter runners time to craft a masterful scheme and divide the attention of the crossbowmen and the militia inside. The gutter runners finally abandoned the concealment of the shadows and emerged en masse to confront the sewer guard. As the assassins tussled with the militiamen, the Globideers tossed their bombs deep into the sewer pipes to cut off all escape routes to the surface. A poison smog filled the tunnels with a fatal inhalant, preventing reinforcements and denying escape. Wearing engineered gas masks, the warp fire throwers marched through the smog unbothered and incinerated all of the remaining militiamen that managed to escape the assassins. With the militia falling swiftly to the Skaven living under the city, more bells began to toll. Another wave of Skaven slaves advanced on the walls, carrying ladders. 
from the armies of Skaven, a line of Warplock Gisale sharpshooters provided long-distance covering fire as the slaves breached the Crab Gate. The Hellstorm rockets were not able to keep up with the sheer numbers of invaders, and eventually became swarmed with Ratmen. The first defense of Moraliano had been annihilated in a carefully executed plan. Prince Giuliano retreated to the central hub of the capital and prepared for the worst. From beyond the wall, Plague Claw catapults fire volleys of their poxed ammunition into the heart of the capital. The inner wall was destroyed just as the Skaven weapon teams emerged from the sewers to begin burning a path into the heart of the capital. Wheeling from the Crab Gate all the way to the new path to the capital's last gate arrived the infamous Warp Lightning Cannon. With a wicked crack, the cannon tore a bolt of Warp Lightning through the heart of the gate, destroying the entrance. The halberdiers were rained upon by poisoned wind globes, effectively preventing any real defense against the coming hordes of rats. Once the Globadiers had captured the entrance, the warp fire throwers entered the cover of the smog again and fired their warp throwers upon the halberdiers and the prince's elite and final few. The halberdiers were incinerated, and as the tolling bell arrived on a rolling battle altar, the prince and his guards were stolen away to Skavenblight for nightmarish experiments. Miraliano was taken in a siege lasting 31 days. The prince's father, Lorenzo, arrived from the south with an army of merchant mercenaries. Realizing that the riches of Moraliano were now totally destroyed, the merchants departed the defensive initiative and fled for the empire or journeyed south to Lustria. Lorenzo and some of his faithful marched into the marshes to rescue his son and his men from a horrible fate, but were never seen again. The territories of Telea and Astalia were taken days after without the support of Moraliano. Thus, the Skaven were now threatening the border princes, southern Bretonia, the Dwarfs, and the Empire. Yet still, after news of the catastrophic siege by Skaven, the Empire refused to acknowledge the existence of the Rat Men. Exploiting this poor choice in judgment, the Under Empire begins a diabolical expansion north gathering support from wayward clans hidden in the mountains, and exploding in population. Meanwhile, Bretonia had now inherited a war front, even while suffering the tides of a bloody civil war. Moreover, the Wood Elves of Athol Lorin stir in the glades between, uneasy at the massive threat to their south and the instability of their Bretonian neighbours. More videos on the end times are on the way. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel and we will catch you on the next one.